and uh, welcome to the August session of the Stanford CME Physician Leadership Virtual Journal Club. I am Daryl Oaks. And I am Ruth Adibuya, and we will be your host today. And the format of this series is a live facilitated webinar with pre-assigned topics and articles for discussion. Each month, we will ask for registrants to, to submit their questions in advance of the session. There will also be opportunities for you to add to the discussion by using the Q&A portion of the Zoom webinar. The goal of the program is to provide practicing physicians in all levels of leadership some insights and management skills to help them be more effective in their clinical environments. Today's discussion will be on what physician leaders need to know about wellness and well being. And uh, for this session, uh, the session is certified for CME credits, and you will receive an email two business days after the session with instructions for how to claim your uh, continuing medical education credits. So the session will start with a review of the articles that we will be discussing today um, to summarize and provide some background for our conversation. And then we will move on to meeting our expert panelists today and having our Q&A session, which will be utilizing questions that have been submitted by our registrants, as well as questions that you can add to the uh, Q&A chat uh, during this session. So I, we're going to start uh, with uh, our, our a summary and Ruth is going to provide us with uh, this discussion. So if you'd like to start Ruth, this would be wonderful. Thank you, Daryl. So today we're gonna go over two articles related to our topic and we will start with the wellness-centered leadership equipping healthcare leaders to cultivate physician well-being and professional fulfillment. So this article begins with describing the current landscape and the challenging times in which physicians practice. They indicate that there are numerous complex factors that have contributed to extensive changes in the practice environment that have altered the nature of physicians' interactions with patients and their role in the healthcare delivery system. Some of which are that physicians are increasingly employed by large healthcare organizations, which is a fundamental shift from the solo or small practice or small group practice model of the past. In addition, the structure of these organizations are more complex than in years past, often involving large integrated systems with a matrix structure. This evolution, the author state, has attenuated physicians' sense of autonomy and control over their work. They state that while most physicians derive great meaning and purpose from their work, many also feel as if they are cogs in the wheel of corporations. In addition, physician performance is now assessed by an array of metrics that can overshadow the appreciation and respect of patients and colleagues that have traditionally served as physicians' main source of feedback. Unfortunately, some organizations attempt to motivate change worsen things because they rely on shaming tactics that leave physicians feeling disrespected and micromanaged by a bureaucracy that fails to recognize the nature of their work. The problem is then further compounded by extensive regulatory oversight, administrative burden, the implementation of suboptimal EHRs used to reinforce to enforce oversight mandates and other factors that can erode meaning and purpose in work. And so even though physicians have readily identified these and other problems in the clinical practice environment, they often feel disempowered to improve the system. The authors believe that all of these factors contribute to high levels of burnout and a decline in professional fulfillment among physicians, and that all of these factors represent leadership issues. Physician leaders who then ignore these challenges perpetuate misalignment between organizational strategy and physicians' deeply held professional values. So how did healthcare organizations get here, and where do healthcare organizations go from here? The authors state that this void of physician leadership in medicine should not be surprising. 
first developing physician leaders was a low priority in the era of solo and small group practice, or in large academic practice models of the past where physicians were managed with benign neglect that allowed unfettered independence. Over the last one to two decades, some healthcare organizations have invested in the development of senior physician leaders. However, they rarely invest in developing the leaders that have the greatest impact on physicians' well being and professional fulfillment, which is those leaders that are most proximal to care delivery. These first line leaders often have not been prepared for this role and may have had limited past leadership experience. Second, physicians' natural tendencies and professional training can be an Achilles heel to being an effective leader. An example given in the article is that physicians tend to be attentive to detail. And in leadership positions, this tendency can lead some to be micromanagers. Additionally, because of their problem-solving role in clinical context, physician leaders often assume it is their responsibility to come up with the answers and to drive change through authority rather than influence. Finally, leading physicians can be quite challenging. Leaders of physicians must help oversee and direct a group of experts who are trained to think critically, be problem solvers, have opinions, and demand evidence for decision making. Effective leadership of such a group then would require skills that are counter to many of the natural tendencies and training experiences of physicians. So where do we go from here? The authors highlight that there is a reason why there's no single model of effective leadership or, if, or leadership development. In fact, there are several effective philosophies and approaches and many models of leadership have been proposed. The article provides a table summary of the major schools of leadership philosophy, philosophy over the last 70 years. In this article, the authors harness those key components and contributions of each of these schools, along with evidence on the relationship between leadership and physician well being, to construct a new integrated model of wellness centered leadership. And the most essential element is empowering relational leadership that produces outcomes consistent with the altruistic values of the profession, involving identifying and enabling implementation of improvements that advance the ability of physicians to provide high quality, compassionate care to patients in an equitable and just practice environment. So let's talk about these elements of wellness-centered leadership. The three are care about people always, cultivate individual and team relationships and inspire change. So for element one, care about people always, this is the foundation of the subsequent elements. Wellness-centered leadership starts with leaders recognizing the pivotal role their behaviors play in the professional fulfillment, vitality and wellness of their team members. According to the authors, caring about people always is the only reliable foundation on which to build relational leadership skills that inspire individual and team performance. Caring about people always begins with caring for self and caring for self is integral to performance. However, they emphasize that although caring for self is foundationally necessary, on its own, it's insufficient to achieve the first element of wellness-centered leadership. Leaders must also nurture the leadership behaviors that demonstrate that they are committed to the professional development and well-being of individuals and have empathy for team members. Element two is cultivate individual and team relationships. Wellness-centered leadership demands a deep respect for individuals, recognizing that people are both good and capable now and immensely able to grow and improve, and that leaders must embrace that the primary function of a leader is to unleash the talent of those they lead and harness that talent to accomplish the mission of the group. Evidence also indicates that the individuals who spend at least 20% of their professional effort dedicated to the activity that they find the most meaningful are at markedly lower risk for burnout, 
which ends up being a critical leadership opportunity to harness each individual's passion and talents in ways that serve the needs of the team. Such efforts by leaders to optimize career fit also typically make individuals more willing to take on other tasks for the good of their team since they feel like their personal needs have been overtly recognized and respected. At the system level, organizations committed to wellness-centered leadership must integrate attention to productivity with concern for people, resulting in efficiency-focused cultures that encourage strong working relationships and make it easy for physicians to provide the care their patients need. The last element is inspired change. The final component of wellness-centered leadership requires that leaders inspire change by encouraging teams to think beyond the status quo, empowering them to drive change and helping them achieve meaningful results. Organizations that cultivate wellness-centered leadership primarily rely on intrinsic motivators to drive results rather than the primarily focusing on aligning incentives using a carrot and stick model. Over time, relying on extrinsic motivators will lower motivation and can transform a motivated individual who pursues their work with a sense of calling into a disengaged worker who views their work through a transactional lens. So each element is broken down into mindset, behaviors, and outcomes. Mindset focuses on the attitude and intention of the leader. Leaders who show up with curiosity and humility, open to opinions and opportunities, are far more effective at promoting wellness than experts who think they know best. Behaviors focus on the leadership actions that bring about the desired outcomes, and outcomes are interim measures of effectiveness that when taken together can lead to cultures of wellness for individuals, teams, and organizations. So the article provides an extensive list of specific examples for each element, and I'll just highlight a few here. So under element one, the care about people always. An example of the mindset is recognition of the role of the leaders, of the role leaders play in well-being, professional fulfillment, and vitality of team members and the team as a whole. With behavior such as role modeling concern, for sleep, rest, vacations, and interpersonal relationships, leading to an outcome of improved health for the team member and the community, as well as psychological safety for individuals. Under element two, cultivate individual and team relationships, an example of the mindset is humility and a deep respect for the individual at, as, both having a, as both unique and capable, and two, immensely able to grow and improve with behavior such as demonstrating respect for the choices others have made, resulting in greater retention and engagement, more effective recruitment, and some examples of other outcomes or values being aligned between team members. Under the last element is inspired change. An example being providing team members with the ability to shape and help lead change, building a sense of community, meaning, and purpose. Some examples of behaviors are delegating tasks that others can perform and are interested in doing, follow up in a way that is empowering, resulting in some outcomes such as sense of co-ownership of the work unit among team members and or improved results and patient confidence in physicians. So in this article, the authors propose the new integ integrative model of wellness-centered leadership. And some of the take-home points are that leadership is a complex set of skills that are required to motivate individuals and teams to help an organization accomplish its mission. Wellness-centered leadership will empower individual and team performance to address current problems faced by healthcare organizations, as well as the iterative innovation needed to address challenges that may arise in the decades to come. Then we move on to our second article, which is the association of burnout, professional fulfillment, and self-care practices with their independently rated leadership effectiveness. 
Although leadership behavior of physician supervisors is associated with the occupational well being of the physicians they supervise, the factors associated with leadership behaviors are poorly understood. As such, the objective stated in this article was to evaluate those associations. Although popular leadership books often dis discuss the importance of caring for self, empirical data on how positive and negative dimensions of the leader's own well being affects their leadership performance are available. In addition, little is known about whether a leader's own well-being and self-care behaviors are associated with the self-care and well-being habits of those they supervise. So let's dig into the methods and measures explained in this article. The Stanford University conducted a survey to inform organizational efforts to improve professional fulfillment and wellness among its physicians in the spring of 2019. And all 2006 656 clinical faculty and affiliated physicians were invited to complete this electronic survey. The survey was completed by practicing physicians as well as first line physician leaders. And the survey included measures of positive and negative dimensions of well being, including professional fulfillment, self valuation, sleep related impairment, and burnout. And I'll just go over some of the, in the tools that were used here. The Professional Fulfillment Index was used to assess burnout. The National Institutes of Health Patient Reported Outcomes Measurement Information System short form version sleep-related impairment scale was used to assess sleep-related impairment. The authors define self-valuation consisting of a growth mindset in addition, in combination with the ability to prioritize self-care and personal well-being. And self-valuation was assessed using the four item clini clinician self-valuation scale. All, our, all participants were asked to select the name of their immediate supervisor um, from the drop-down menu that listed the names of their department chair, division chiefs, and medical clinic directors. They then evaluated this leader using the Mayo Clinic Participatory Management Leadership Index. So just a brief overview of some of what they reported. So among the 2,656 clinical faculty and affiliated physicians invited to participate, 60% returned surveys. Of the 1924 faculty physicians invited to participate, 66.8 returned surveys. And among these, 50.7% were women and 49.3 were men. And 56% were 40 years or older. And among the, the 117 physician leaders evaluated, 57% had their leadership behavior independently evaluated by at least five physicians from their unit. And among the 67 leaders, 57 of them personally completed their wellness survey. And so they report that although the difference in the professional fulfillment scores persisted after adjusting for age and sex, the difference in burnout scores between physician leaders and physicians who were not in leadership positions was not significant after adjusting for age and sex. And no significant differences in self-evaluation or sleep-related impairment scores were observed between physician leaders and physicians who were not in leadership role. And so what they did find is that the overall level of burnout, professional fulfillment, and self-evaluation of physician leaders were associated with their leadership behavior score as independently rated by the physicians they supervised. And you can see kind of on the screen, the point increase related to each of the, um, the burnout score, the uh, professional fulfillment scale and the self-valuation score. The authors say that these findings have critical implications for organizational efforts to enhance leadership effectiveness and reduce occupational distress among physicians and other healthcare professionals. So what are the key take-home points? That leaders' own levels of burnout, professional fulfillment, and self-valuation are associated with their leadership behavior. A leader's personal behavior with respect to sleep health also may have an important role modeling effect on those they lead. And lastly, organizations should prioritize the well being of leaders as an important driver of leader effectiveness and provide training, skill building, and additional support to improve leader well being as an integral element of leadership development efforts. 
So that wraps up the review of the two articles for today's discussion, and I'll turn it over to Daryl. Thank you, Ruth, uh, for that really excellent summary of the articles. Um, and that's a really nice way to frame our discussion today. Um, I uh, would now like to uh, introduce our expert panelists who will be helping us understand these concepts and how uh, we as physician leaders can help promote the wellness and well being of our team. So, first, I would like to start with introducing Dr. Leah Bacchus. Um, Dr. Bacchus trained in general surgery at the University of Southern California and cardiothoracic surgery at the University of California, Los Angeles. She practices at Stanford Hospital and is chief of thoracic surgery at the VA Palo Alto. Her surgical practice consists of general thoracic surgery with special emphasis on thoracic oncology and minimally invasive surgical techniques. She is also the co-director of thoracic surgery, uh, clinical research, um, programming and serves on the board of directors of the Society of Thoracic Surgery. And as an educator, Dr. Bacchus is the associate program director for the Thoracic Track Residency and is the chair of the ACGME Residency Review Committee for Thoracic Surgery, which is the accrediting body for all uh, cardiothoracic surgery in uh, training programs in the U.S. Welcome. The, uh, and now we also have uh, Dr. Mickey uh, Trokol. Uh, Dr. Trokol uh, is the Director of Evidence-Based Innovation at the Stanford University School of Medicine WellMD Center. His development of novel measurement tools has led to a growing focus on professional fulfillment as a foundational aim of efforts to promote physician well-being. And his scholarship also uh, identifies interpersonal interactions at work as a modifiable core determinant of an organizational culture that cultivates wellness. So Dr. Uh, Trokel serves also as uh, the chair of the Physician Wellness Ac Academic Consortium Scientific Board, which is a group of academic medical centers that are working together to improve uh, physician well-being. So, a welcome uh, to both you, uh, Dr. Bacchus and Dr. Trokel. Thank you so much for being here. The, uh, so uh, just you know, to start our conversation out, maybe we'll sort of generally start um, with sort of you know, in light of the two articles and discussions we've had, um, maybe we could just start, uh, and I will probably have one of you start and then I'll have the other one of you also give uh, an answer so you both get a chance to respond. Um, uh, maybe we'll start with uh, you, Dr. Trogol, with, you know, what, you know, what can physicians leaders do? And this is physician leaders at all levels um, uh, of leadership. What can they specifically focus on doing to support their teams? And I know we, you know, had some uh, um, uh, techniques laid out in these articles, but maybe what, what are ones that you think should be highlighted um, and that would be helpful to physicians uh, that they're managing, find meaning in the sort of somewhat stressful work environments? There are many. I'll just mention one quickly, and that is an inclusive leadership style. Amy Edmonds has demonstrated that teams that have an inclusive leadership style are more likely to have a uh, all team members engaged in quality improvement efforts. And so that if there's one thing that I can think of that's a method for a leader to, you know, to, to run forward with in improving the function of their team, it's that. And what does that mean? That means uh, appreciative inquiry, actually engaging the individuals who a leader is leading in thinking about the problems that they face at work and the solutions to those problems in an ongoing improvement effort. Yeah, no, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. Dr. Bacchus, do you have anything you would like to sort of add to that? It's it's so awkward, you know, because these are Dr. Trokel's articles, you know? <laughs> so I feel like they were so very eloquently already laid out there. No, I mean, I, I 
that one point that he raised is something that is huge and can be expanded upon all by itself, you know. Um, but no, I, I think if it that's a that's a solid single one to point out for sure. Yeah, no, and you know, and I I guess the uh, one one place that I would sort of wonder too is the article talked a little bit about uh, this concept. You know, I think we're often thinking about you know inclusivity, and I'm wondering also, you know, whether or not we should be um, thinking about uh, inclusivity in the term in in sort of broader terms. I, I was thinking a little bit what are some of the risks of uh, burnout that you have seen as being, you know, you know, sort of highly high factors for burnout in physician groups. For either of you, I think Dr. Bacchus works in a in a highly intense work environment, and uh, Dr. Trokel, you you work in an environment you you study this. So I'm just curious from both your perspectives where you have seen you know sort of risks for burnout being highest. I think that that whole you know cog in a wheel adds to um, depersonalization and uh, lack of accountability even for one's actions. So on the on the one uh, end of the spectrum, it can just be reflected as apathy, but on the other extreme end of the spectrum, it can be sort of totally malproductive and really completely undermine, you know, the agenda of a, of a team, of an organization where you don't feel that your actions are truly going to translate into anything meaningful. And in fact, some of them could be harmful. Um, and particularly in medicine, we're talking about, you know, patient safety and medical errors and uh, things where the stakes are incredibly high. So there are many, many layers to that accountability piece. But I think that kind of um, cog in a wheel really and the depersonalization that comes along with that can be hugely detrimental if left unfettered. That's a great answer. And I'll add just a little bit to that. Um, in thinking about what happens in the context of the apathy that Dr. Bacchus is talking about, the apathy in the cognitive wheel as just one more thing, just one more thing is, is added to what physicians have to do in order to provide the care that they wanna provide and other factors that in some settings at least can contribute to an unreasonable set of demands. Um, one of the things that can lead to is sleep-related impairment as people have more to do than they can simply than they can get done in a reasonable time frame, and they're doing their work with pajama time and electronic health record at night and, and other ways eroding their sleep. What happens when sleep is eroded is physicians in that context, like every other human being, actually drop off in their cognitive performance. So then they're less able to focus. One of the key uh, early indicators of de decreased cognitive performance is that the ability to engage the frontal parietal network in the brain, which is needed to, to make really key decisions and process information in ways that physicians have to do all the time as they practice medicine in almost any context. The ability to focus that part, of, you know, engage that part of the brain versus what happens in, its, in, in the default, it's actually called the default mode, network, the, the default mode, mode record, network is more of a daydream state that probably is, is engaged in uh, almost exclusively as people fall asleep. When we're well rested, we're able to focus and, and engage the right brain centers, the, the frontal parietal network readily. As soon as we missed a sleep by 24 hours of insufficient sleep, two nights in a row of only five hours of sleep or multiple nights in a row of less than six hours sleep, which happens all the time for physicians in some contexts, then we really lose capacity to focus. Notes take longer, but more importantly, the focus that we need to avoid making mistakes falls off. And so then physicians are subjected to this really difficult, awkward circumstance where they're legally responsible for what happens. They deeply care about what happens. That's why they went into medicines to help people. And yet they've been put in an environment where they're not able to take care of, of their basic human needs enough to, to be at the top of their game. And that 
is a real problem. And when they are in that context, and then in addition, have apathy from leaders and others they work with, things are really hard for docs. Yeah, those are both uh, excellent points. And I, I'll just, you know, sort of briefly say, I mean, I think I, I remember the early studies on residents and sleep deprivation. In fact, some of them were done um, in my residency training group. Uh, and, you know, I think we, we have a lot of data to say that performance does decline and mistakes occur. And it's interesting, we haven't uh, totally translated that into the professional work life environment. We've we focused mostly on the training environment um, for controlling that. So I think it's a very important point to bring to light that just because we're out of training doesn't mean we stop needing to sleep regular hours, though our work environment doesn't necessarily support that. Um, and I, I think a little bit to your point, Dr. Bacchus, I, I think one of the um, the article on uh, wellness-centered leadership does point out, and I'll, I'll quote it, teams and individual team members should be provided uh, with the greatest possible flexibility and control over how they accomplish group and organizational aims um, as sort of a overarching principle. And I really think that you know, what we often see in, you know, sort of these organizational structures and um, hospitals that might be frustrating is sort of these top-down uh, decision-making uh, systems that, you know, sort of the physicians are sort of, you know, they, they land, they, they get told what is going to happen, and they aren't part of uh, those discussions. And I think that rather maybe there's an opportunity for us to switch that, to think of it uh, as the role as our leaders to be empowering and supporting physicians to do the innovation themselves um, and create those changes. But I'm just, you know, sort of curious your response and thought about, you know, how decisions are made in hospitals and how, how that impacts um, uh, our practices. It's funny that you, you mentioned that. I, I, I always kind of held on to this dogma from general surgery days of training that, um, the culture of your team, you know, every, every place is a team in microcosm, you know, and so just your little team, you know, trauma A team, um, that the culture of the team was highly predicated on the uh, chief resident and that the efficiency of the team was predicated on the intern or the medical students or the sub-I. Um, and so I do think that it's important for the leaders to um, create the culture that they think is going to be the most conducive to get the team to perform the best that they can. And that will look different for different teams, for different um, uh, purposes uh, that a given team has. Um, but it takes, I, I think it's, it's impossible to have a culture of change if you don't have that buy-in from the top. That's not to say that it, that's the only place it comes from and can emanate from, but it has to be you know, the leaders have to be engaged and fully committed to it. Um, uh, and likewise, they've got to then have that trickle down and diffuse into all layers of the team in order to get it get it accomplished. But having a change um, uh, emanate from the bottom up, I think, is sort of a, a bit of a losing battle, which which sucks for those people that are at the bottom of the pyramid. And I myself have been at the bottom of several pyramids and understand what that feels like. And again, that disempowerment, that, you know, cog in the wheel feeling, um, all of that is going to lead to that apathy and despair and, and, and asking the people who would otherwise benefit the most to help to affect change to, for, for themselves, <laughs> you know, is, is this like really awful circular uh, argument that, that doesn't win for anyone. That's a really good point. Um, and I, I, I want to respond to it, and I will in a second, but I'm going to let uh, Dr. Troco also respond. Oh, so well said. And that's what happens when we go and give wellness talks to individuals. Sometimes we actually <laughs> engender rage because that they feel that. And they feel that they're being asked to on top of all, everything else they're responsible for and, and, and feeling like a cog in the wheel. They're telling them now they need to suck it up and show up happy to work. And they better fix it because it's incumbent on them, their professionalism to do so. And yeah, it doesn't go over well. So the organizational systemic factors have to be addressed. And that's, that's where leaders have a really important role. I mean, I think to that point, I, I've, I don't know if either of you have heard, um, there's a you know, sort of a business uh, leader who does a lot of speaking, uh, uh, Simon Sinek, and he 
he discusses the concept in business that if we want productive, successful um, companies uh, that are, we, we actually need to invest in our workforce <laughs> um, and that you can't expect the workforce to produce well if you aren't supporting it and nurturing it and that it will do things for you you can't expect and you can't mandate, but that those will come uh, if you start with them as the most important thing to sort of build and support, as opposed to a lot of the focus is on the financials or the customers. And I'm curious, I know medicine is somewhat different in a sense that, I don't know, maybe leading physicians, it's kind of like herding cats. We all, we all, we all want to be at the head of the line. Um, we all have our own ideas. And that's how we were trained and that's how we got here. But, you know, maybe leading physicians is different, but I, I wonder if there's a similar principle that we could put into, you know, sort of success in our environment. If you invest in the individuals um, that the physician, and that may be an argument for the physician leaders that if you invest in the uh, frontline physicians, they will solve the problem for you. Um, but you know, I don't know if that resonates with either of you. It truly resonates with me. I mean, because I feel like, you know, probably 50% of what I do on a daily basis, I didn't learn in medical school. Um, nor was I really ever even, it wasn't even a, an inkling of a thought in my head, you know, like that I'd spend so much time in meetings and <laughs> you know, all the interpersonal interactions that aren't just patient physician. And I wonder how much of the, um, uh, angst, if you will, that many physicians who are experiencing burnout, um, can be attributed to sort of lack of preparation and that, you know, we're being asked to, to, to do things that we had no idea we were going to be asked to do, nor that we had any amount of training to do and to do it well. So it's sort of like you get spit out at the end of this training pipeline and of which very little has been infused in terms of physician leadership and wellness, et cetera, more so now, um, but sort of historically so, there's been very little devoted to any of this. A little bit of professionalism, like, yeah, make sure you complete your charts and stuff like that and be a good um, Samaritan, but not really the actual concrete skill building exercises and tools to truly hit the ground running, but then you're kind of expect to hit the ground running. And like, just because you've got an MD and a board certification behind you, that you're now, you're now expected to lead and be a leader and do it well. I mean, I don't know where that assumption comes from, but like you said, Dr. Oates, Oaks, like we, we, um, you know, physicians are a very special self-selected group of people. And so maybe some of us kind of gravitated and, and, and totally believe in that anyway, but I, I suspect even the ones that do believe in it could stand to have a bit more training in this area. I think the see one, do one, teach one um, <laughs> model may, may be a little broken, but I mean, I, and I, I think I just to piggyback on that. I mean, I, I feel like that's often true that we have basically trained up physicians with all of these wonderful desire to make a difference in the world of our patients. We've given them all these skill sets and then we threw them into an environment for which they were completely not prepared. I mean, we work in a medical business. Um, we don't understand even how the business is organized. Uh, many of us don't realize how the hospital is structured and how decisions are made. And so I do feel like, you know, to your other point too, is there's multiple, multiple, multiple cousins of leadership within these structures. Um, there is need for leadership skills at all levels of physician, you know, sort of functioning. So I, I, my bias is that we could all, you know, benefit from having more of these skill sets sort of part of our general curriculum. But I think to, um, uh, to Dr. Trokel, like along those lines in terms of burnout being maybe related to not having those skill sets. Um, and, you know, it, it, it brings me to sort of a question with the the study uh, looking at um, burnout and um, in physicians and leadership uh, scores, whether or not, you know, is there, you know, we, we sort of maybe assume in this that burnout is leading to poor leadership scores, but is there, is there maybe a reverse possibility? Is there, a, where, which, which direction is the causality in that relationship? Is that something we should be thinking about? Yeah, we don't have good data to demonstrate direction of causality yet. In almost every other study 
where we've looked at causality and factors in, in a social science setting like this, we find that relationships are reciprocal. So it's hard to imagine a world where the causation doesn't go in both directions. Certainly feeling inept at one's job leads to burnout. And when one feels poorly, poorly prepared for roles assigned, then that's gonna be hard. It's gonna make it hard to feel professionally fulfilled and increase risk for burnout. And it's also true that, that burnout leads to psychological states that are gonna to lead to poorer performance as a clinician and certainly as a leader. Yeah, no, I think that's all true. Um, you know, I do wonder to your to your your question there, and it's more of a hypothetical point. But um, you know, what's what's to be said about the composition of the teams and the uh, responsibility of team leaders to be um, uh, very pointed and directed about how it is that they acquire and um, place people on their teams and so not just cultivating the existing personnel but how do you recruit and actually select the right people for the team and we have this affinity bias right where people want to you know connect with folks that they've got commonalities with which sort of flies in the face of of diversity and what we all know to be true and that diverse teams uh, just are are better by many many um, performance metrics so how do we how do you reconcile that, particularly with that second study, right? You know, where, um, you know, do they do they just perform poorly because you picked people who also devalue sleep and <laughs> therefore not very well? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Is that, is that a question to me? Go ahead. Go ahead. It was sort of. Great. Um, I think your that your last point is a really good one. That if we're picking people who are chosen to be leaders because they have the most NIH grants and they're the most productive, they might not be valuing their own uh, health and well being in some ways. And you mentioned sleep. And as you can tell, that's something I'm interested in specifically. And uh, another effect of, of sleep deprivation on cognitive performance is a fallout of emotional intelligence, essentially. The, 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 you know, regulation of emotional intensity uh, goes way down. There's prefrontal cortex areas that regulate the amygdala uh, output during, you know, during distress that aren't very functional in the context of sleep deprivation. And people are less able to, to be an empathetic mirror, accurately perceive and reflect back the, uh, the, uh, the emotional state of somebody else. Both of those things suggest decreased emotional intelligence we know what happens when people have poor emotional intelligence at work. Um, and if they're more emotional to begin with, they'll be more reactive and all things go bad. And it certainly doesn't lead to a culture of wellness. And we can turn that around um, with careful attention to, to our own basic human well-being. And that's, that's, a, that's a, 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 a biological based you know, neuroscience argument for the causality being you know, well-being leads to improved leadership through the mechanism of, of emotional intelligence. I think that's absolutely true. And I guess maybe I can ask sort of pointed personal questions for both of you around environments. And I think to the point that, you know, uh, Dr. Bacchus, uh, uh, you work in a intense uh, environment of the operating room, which I know well as a cardiac anesthesiologist myself, um, you, know, you know, you not only work in a very intense environment, but you are also, um, you know, sort of, unusual in that environment as being uh, a woman of color um, in an environment, a profession where uh, there are, uh, it's, it has historically been very male dominated. I'm just curious how, how do you maintain your wellness uh, and well-being in those environments? Um, because these are, there's obviously a lot of pressure and a lot of pressure not to sleep too. I, I will throw that in there too. <laughs> Sorry, um, I I don't know that I have some stellar recipe per se. I do try to very much practice a culture of inclusiveness, um, and um, I'm terrible with names. But despite that severe handicap, I wish I had like a ribbon or a sticker or something so people could know that. Um, but despite that, I do still try to have a connection with everyone in the room. Um, 
with the, uh, you know, our anesthesiologist, the anesthesia resident, you know, actually speak to them by their names rather than calling them anesthesia. Um, you know, to uh, my medical students or any nursing students, especially because I think that can be an incredibly intimidating environment for for students to try to flourish in, which is, you know, like, how do you just walk in an operating room as a medical student if you've never been there before and, and try to be a rock star? That's pretty intimidating. But um, and in, in one of the tricks that I do there for others is to give everyone like a task, you know, specifically that medical student that I say, listen, you know, this is this retractor, we're sitting it here, it's kind of precarious, your jobs make sure it doesn't fall, you know, um, or um, I would like you to suture this chest tube in and put this one stitch in. And then I ask them, how do you feel about it? You feel pretty secure. You feel pretty confident. It's not going to fall out and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and then they're totally fixated on the task. <laughs> the rest of it, if they weren't engaged before, they're totally engaged now because at minimum, they don't want to get in trouble. But I don't, I mean, I don't put the fear in them. I just want to make sure that they understand that everyone in the room has a responsibility uh, to the patient and they're all part of this team. So, Little things like that um, in that microcosm of the OR environment um, to try to create inclusion. And to the extent that I'm able to, I don't necessarily endorse this for everyone because everyone is not so comfortable with that, but I do try to connect with people outside of the OR, outside of work when, when possible, when feasible. It's never anything that should be forced on somebody because it's not a part of your job, but it can be additive, it can be a, it can be a bonus if it's there, if it organically otherwise, you know, can happen. I love that. I mean, I think appreciating the multidimensionality of our lives, right? We're, we right. show up as one person, but there's a whole lot of pieces of us that are not in the room necessarily Absolutely. at that time. So it's nice to recognize that. Well, ask a follow-up question. Oh yeah, sure. So that, I, Dr. Bacchus mentioned specifically a relationship with anesthesiologists. And, you know, we all hold one share in the culture of medicine that we're a part of and relationships across teams that's critical for our culture of wellness and and thinking about that warrants uh, at least a, a moment of attention yeah. and we have right here uh, <laughs> an anesthesiologist and a surgeon i wonder in this cross-discipline interaction uh, what you've seen that goes poorly and what goes well um, and you know, this is, you know, this is great for thinking about how to how to cultivate those behaviors that that are effective and in, in improving our culture of wellness. Well, and I think to that other point about kind of um, different contexts within which you're able to interact with people is critical to help fortify those relationships. So. The fact that I uh, am out on committees and meetings and things like that and interacting with my, just using anesthesia as an example, with my anesthesia colleagues outside of the immediacy of this case that we're trying to get through with this patient, I think is incredibly important. So it doesn't have to be, hey, we're going out for beers. It can just be, hey, we're working together on this other outside project, blah, 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 all of those things. And again, that speaks to the diversity issue, right? Where you need diversity of specialties, of ages, of genders, of everything, and as many places as you can to create those touch points that will fortify those relationships um, when you're in those more critical environments. Right. Yes, I, I think those are wonderful ideas. And I, I think maybe just to follow up from your research, Dr. Chuckle, anything that you do in your life that you feel like is, you know, that sustains sort of your prof professional work um, and well wellness. Well, I'll mention one factor that we haven't talked about yet. Um, and that is, uh, attention to personal relationships in my life. This is a, a research domain that, uh, that's really exciting to me. We have, have a paper coming out hopefully soon that we've just submitted um, that demonstrated that, uh, in fact, when physicians feel like their personal relationships are being eroded by work demands, that that's a huge risk factor for burnout and has some implications for what happens in their patient care as well. And those implications for what happens in, in patient care is, is something we're excited about because it then for the first time 
presents the possibility that this too might be something for, uh, worthy of consideration by leaders in organizations. Because if in fact, you know, an unpredictable schedule in the OR means that physicians in the OR, both surgeons and anesthesiologists are going home at random times. And even on days they're not on call, they have no way to predict when they're gonna get out. Then that might be create problems that could in turn eventually affect, uh, affect patient outcomes, affect the way in which they're able to practice medicine. So that's, that's an exciting vein of, of research for me. I'm looking forward to, to seeing what we can do in, no, I, in that space. Yeah, no, I think our, in, I think our, our, our personal environments and our personal experiences um, are incredibly important to what, how we perceive and experience our environments. And I think that sort of brings me to one of my sort of thoughts and sort of observations from the literature is that there is actually considerable evidence that um, you know, marginalized groups or minor groups that are minorities in various fields, whether it's gender or uh, race or ethnicity, you know, have been documented uh, to have increased rates of burnout um, and even, uh, you know, to the point of, you know, mental health related uh, depression uh, experiences, increased rates of suicidal ideation and things like that. Um, and this was, I think, some research that was done in uh, physician trainees specifically. Um, but I guess that raises the question to me that, how, you know, how can we disconnect uh, these efforts to improve uh, well-being and wellness from sort of this inclusive, we're, we're talking a lot about how important it is to be uh, inclusive from sort of general efforts for diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, I mean, I've already spoken a little bit about that diversity piece that I think is pretty, um, pretty critical. And, you know, if you are uh, an N of one, <laughs> um, then it's very difficult for you, or not very difficult, it can be difficult, more difficult to um, feel that connectedness, um, both from, from, from that the side of the individual uh, who may just kind of have some walls up because they don't see the see the obvious connection points, um, but as well from the from the larger group, from the majority group, who may not have the insight to actually make better connections and things like that too. So, um, like Dr. Trockel mentioned earlier, I mean these things are often bidirectional; they're not really just occurring in in you know in isolation, but. Um, for me, as a, as, a, as a member of um, multiple minority groups, if you will, uh, one of the things that's helped me is to uh, foster those external communications and relationships with people. If I can't find the um, fellowship that I need, and that's important to nourish my soul at, my, at, at this location, in this meeting, in this whatever, the onus is then on me to try to find it elsewhere, because if I at least recognize that I need it, then that's half the battle. You know, I think part of the issue is not having sufficient self-awareness to even think that it is important for you. And sometimes you don't until someone steps up and says, hey, do you want to try X or whatever? And you're like, you know what, that's like so much better than what I've been doing. You know, it's kind of like that sleep deprived thing, right? But Dr. Struggle, I mean, like, you know what, when I sleep more, I feel better. But for many, it could be like this newsflash, you know, because um, you're just so entrenched into your, you know, the rabbit hole of what you do every day that it's hard to kind of take your head out of the sand and look around a little bit more. And so having those external relationships helps to serve as a sounding board. You know, sometimes you're not your own best friend, but a best friend can be helpful to kind of say, do you really see what you're doing here? Like that doesn't look healthy. <laughs> Do you think there's a role, and I think there's a question here um, in the chat, um, in the Q&A, that sort of reflects on it, and I think it's, it relates to, um, you know, training physicians and providing, and I'm going to shorten the question, uh, uh, but it, are you familiar with studies that have shown how uh, leadership programs and maybe executive leadership programs can improve physician leadership skills and capabilities that might help with um, you know, burnout, these feelings of burnout and frustration. Um, I don't know if, if you have seen this or there's been any studies on it um, or uh, just, you know, sort of observations. 
Dr. Trocco may have a better hand on 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 literature um, in this space. I can speak from the side of the ACGME to say that it is certainly a priority uh, and is built into um, the you know hardwired into the evaluation process of a given program. That at minimum they've got to have practices in place and uh, resources in place for residents, which is about as far as we've gone. Uh, from a, from an accrediting body standpoint, but at least there's some acknowledgement and recognition that that it is important. There's not a, a ton of good literature yet looking at, at training leaders and the impact of leadership training on uh, professional well-being among those they lead. It's mostly observational correlations that we have so far. There's some efforts that are underway. And we'll see how what pan, what pans out. I want to just just say put something really briefly about your previous question, and that is that a, a lot of what we see in the falling out of of uh, equity and inclusion, or the, the most egregious departures from that in the area of mistreatment, is from our is not from our colleagues. The most the most the most predominant uh, problem is how patients sometimes, patients and their families treat uh, individuals who, who they perceive as different from them in some way. And so that's just one component that leaders need to be aware of and address systematically and figure out how to, how to help in that domain. If we focus only on what's happening with, with our colleagues at work, while important, that misses the biggest problem uh, that we're seeing, at least empirically the biggest in, in research that we've been doing recently. That's an important piece to address. You know, and I think the mistreatment by patients is such a complex issue because we're, we're that's our, our, our mission is to take care of them and support them. Um, I would also throw in the complicating factor if we find our healthcare systems frustrating as providers, patients also find them frustrating, right? And so they then take their frustration out on the person most available, which would be the first line frontline provider. And I think that is just a, just a very complex issue to know how to not only manage, but also, um, you know, uh, sort of address and fix. So agree. Um, there is, um, uh, we're, we have maybe time for one or uh, two more questions here. I think, um, you know, thinking about how, uh, you know, the last year and a half has gone, <laughs> um, and there's been a number of things that have come up in the last year and a half, and that, you know, both have been this, you know, the, the, the pandemic, which has obviously had an enormous impact on on medicine and on our lives in general, but also the uh, sort of reignitement or maybe more visibility of discussions of race and ethnicity and disparities in our country. I'm curious how that plays out um, in this conversation and whether or not it's changed maybe what some of the drivers are of burnout uh, for physicians or whether the principles are still the same. It's just a you know sort of more intense environment now. I think the principles are the same. I don't think that they've changed all that much. Um, I think that they've um, uh, just kind of had a new contemporary spin on some of them, but that the overarching themes are still there. I mean, I don't, I certainly don't mean to say that there's been zero progress made because there has been. Um, we have a long way to go still. And I mean, one of the novel areas, I think, as 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 um, and a member of an underrepresented group, that that myself and many colleagues uh, would report upon after, like you know, George Floyd and the whole Black Lives Matter movement really took took a foothold was the fatigue associated with people checking on you and wanting you to be the spokesperson and. Um, wanting to have cathartic conversations of their own, um, all of that was just, uh, you know, like Dr. Truckle said, one more thing, just one more thing or, or several more things to, to add to your plate. That certainly died down some, but not, 
not to pre uh, George Floyd levels, I would say. <laughs> no, I think the social anxiety and again, there's a lot of lot of water being carried by um, some in our uh, professional community. So thank you for calling that out. I think it's really it's really true. So, well, we're at the end of our time and I want to respect everyone's time. This has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you again for coming and joining us. Um, we uh, have so enjoyed having your perspectives on this really important topic that obviously has a number of complex dimensions. So um, again, I want to um, just remind everyone, uh, thank you for coming and that uh, please uh, join us next session, um, which will be September 28th. Uh, and uh, we um, you know, will send out a mailing list again.